Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of our Lightning interview series. So as always, we like to make these sessions interesting and interactive. So please do introduce yourself and tell us where you are joining from and, of course, what you do. So before we get started with today's interview with um, Professor Tina Lassirad from Northeastern on risk assessment for machine learning, and by the way, she'll also be speaking at ODSC East, and we do have a track on responsible AI and machine learning safety. A few quick notes before we get into that. Um, of course, um, we have a number of events coming up as always, and top of our list is our virtual deep learning bootcamp with the ever excellent Dr. John Cron, and that continues through the month of April. And by the way, if you uh, do sign up, you can get that QR code uh, that bootcamp is free if you have an ODSC bootcamp or training pass, I believe. And then, of course, our big announcement is that ODSC is back in person at the Boston Heinz Convention Center in two short weeks, but it will also be both in person and virtual. And as always, you can pick up this show uh, and our recordings on our AI Plus um, website, and you'll see on the screen there some of the previous um, sessions we had. And in addition to that, speaking of ODSC East, um, as you probably well know, ODSC's goal is to make uh, data science more accessible. And this year's um, event at ODSC in Boston, uh, both virtual and in person, by the way, is free for all talks. So you can uh, show up in person, um, network, reconnect with your community, um, or attend online. So I believe we've over uh, 110 talks, keynotes, track keynotes, and um, lots of other stuff going on which you can um, get access to. And if you prefer to um, do some upskilling, we have a 30% off discount happening until end of day today or this weekend. And in addition, uh, we have another community service um, for the ODSC community because we know how hard it is to break into the field of data science and AI. So our AI plus career platform, it's free both to job seekers as well as companies. So if you if you or your company are looking to hire, just uh, post a job on there. Um, you go onto the website and you can post a job there. And if you're looking for a job, we will have a career fair at the um, at ODSC is this year. So with that, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce today's incredibly accomplished guest. And this is an abbreviated bio, by the way. So Tina Alassia Rad is a professor of computer science at Northeastern University and a core faculty member at Northeastern University's Network Science Institute. Her research is rooted in data mining and machine learning and spans theory, algorithms, and applications of big data from network representations to physical and social phenomena. She has a very impressive over 100 peer review publications, including a uh, a few best paper and best paper runner-up awards. And Tina's work has been applied to personalized search on the World Wide Web, fraud detection, mobile ad targeting, cyber situational awareness, and ethics in machine learning. And now her algorithms have been incorporated in systems uh, used by government and industry. Tina, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seamus. And thank you for that nice introduction. Um, sure. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, delighted to have you. So, Tina, we've got a lot of ground to cover, but I just want to get straight uh, to the point. So tell us a bit about yourself and perhaps a bit about your journey to becoming this world-renowned network science expert. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I was always interested in math. I found math very easy. And uh, my dad studied control theory back in the um, late 60s, early 70s. In fact, he worked on autonomous vehicles back then. Wow. <laughs> With, uh, with the computers that they had at the time, Department of Transportation in the United States was very interested in that work. Um, and of course, the computers weren't fast enough. For example, you could only compute the Taylor expansion series to second place, you know, and you know, if the wind is too much, then that approximation is not good enough. Awesome. And I remember uh, that we would get IEEE computer magazines at home. And so the fascination between basically electrical engineering and math led me to computer science, then led me to AI and machine learning, took a class in machine learning in college, was really interesting. At the time, it was the winter of AI in the 1990s. And then over the years, I got interested in graphs and networks, and that led me to network science. 
which is an interdisciplinary field where we like to look at phenomena in terms of complex networks and then build predictive and descriptive phenomena of them. So Excellent. example, um, this is actually work by John Kleinberg at Cornell, uh, who is your romantic partner on Facebook, right? Um, so that's a social network, that's a complex network. Uh, and so you are the center of the star, there are petals around you. These petals have more triangles around them. And like your high school friends know more uh, of each other than like your college friends. And the people you introduce to these petals are either your sibling or your romantic partner. And when you stop introducing them to the different petals, it's a leading indicator that you will break up in two months. And so Facebook can start uh, showing you single bar ads or well, you know, ads example. for online dating. But it's, a, it's one of the you know, examples that people understand when it comes to network science easily. Yeah, that's a, that's, um, a great example of network science. And, um, and by the way, um, that's, a, that's a very awesome journey story. And it's great to have a, you had a mentor so close to home. And, um, Got you to the AI winter and uh, fascinating because mm -hmm. um, people forget there was a lot of research going on in autonomous vehicles in the 60s and 70s even. So that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, I haven't seen an autonomous beetle yet, but I'm sure there's, mm -hmm. there's one around there um, in somebody's garage. Um, so um, so you, you gave some great examples of network science and um, perhaps um, our audience might be a little more familiar with graph networks and I know a lot of people in the industry um, use the use the term network and graph uh, synonymously do you want to give us a little more a um, bit more of a definition of network science um, at least from an academic standpoint what network science is versus some of the other disciplines I guess yeah so graphs are mathematical objects right they're abstract data structures um, networks are instantiations of them right mm -hmm. And so um, network science is interdisciplinary field. So you have physicists, you have social scientists, you have mathematicians, you have computer scientists, you have communications um, scientists, that they all come together. And the thing that they have in common is that they like to represent whatever phenomenon of interest there is um, as a network. So for example, I have a grant from National Science Foundation about whether can we, can we predict evolution? Right. So if I take fish in Alaska from freshwater to saltwater, can I predict how their gene co-expression networks changes? Right. Can I predict how their proximity networks change? And through that, can I predict how they will evolve? And so and this is work with, of course, ecologists and biologists, et cetera. Right. And um, so it's just thinking about the world in in that's connected. Right. That's basically what network science is. That's an excellent um, overview and a great example of um, how this actually can, can be applicable. Now, um, Tina, I mentioned you prior to us coming on the air. I happened to be at Northeastern University last week doing a college tour. That's my old uh, alma mater. Um, it's an incredible campus, and um, especially since a lot has changed since I've been there. Some, you've got some, you know, some fascinating um, research buildings, and I, I would encourage anyone who's ever got the chance uh, around Boston to go look at some of the uh, new research buildings um, that have just been uh, built at Northeastern. And um, network science is, is somewhat new, um, relatively speaking. And Northeastern uh, actually has a whole institute of network science. So can you tell us a little bit more about what kind of research you and your team are focused on at the uh, Northeastern University's uh, Network Science Institute? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the one thing is obviously like graph theory has been around for hundreds of years, right? Uh, and people have been fascinated in terms of um, graphs or communication networks, transportation networks, et cetera. Uh, in America after 9-11, if you remember, there was all this stuff that if we could have only connected the dots, right? right if we right. could have only knew what the network was. And then a lot of funding, a lot of research funding went into the study of networks and network science in particular. Oh, and so at Northeastern, we uh, do interdisciplinarity really well. And so the Network Science Institute has nine core faculty. We all sit together. Uh, and as I was mentioning, it's interdisciplinary. So on the floor that I am, uh, my office is, and my lab is, there's a very prominent social scientist, David Lazar, and a very prominent physicist, Alessandro Vespigiani, who have their labs and their students. And so my students get to talk and learn from physicists and social scientists and vice versa, right? And so, for example, Alessandro Vespigiani is a world expert on network epidemiology. 
And of course, we're going through a pandemic, right? It, it's all about contact, right, reports, right. right? And how does the um, the um, the virus spread? And and Alessandro um, advises WHO and CDC, and his work has been showcased in New York Times, etc. Right? Or like David Lazar, who's a computational social scientist, is interested in and misinformation and disinformation and how the, those um, um, the, the the non facts propagate through our social platforms um, and so he has this huge project in terms of why um, people uh, spread information and in fact that's a project that I lead with the Volkswagen Foundation funding in terms of can we make online discourse better in terms of my personal lab. Um, mm -hmm. I am a computer scientist, so I generate new methodology, right? It's new algorithms. So can I generate new algorithms, new models that can do, uh, that, that can predict evolution better? Um, can I build models and algorithms that are more robust in terms of adversarial machine learning that you mentioned? Um, can I build um, graph distances? So this is more on the theoretical side um, that have some mathematical backing because distances and similarity um, are inherently ill-defined, Ill as we say, similarity is in the eye of the beholder. But for example, by looking at some work in topology, uh, we were able to come up with a new graph distance um, that has really good uh, mathematical foundation. It's called the non-backtracking um, distance, um, where then you are able to rely on really good foundational math to say why these two graphs are similar or different. That's very insightful. And um, of the many, many papers you've uh, authored and co-authored, and um, one that springs to mind, because um, just, just sticking with network um, science for a little bit before we move on to adversarial networks and all that good stuff, um, you uh, co-authored a paper on the limitations of network online learning. Can you speak to that paper? Yeah. So the problem there is that however big your data is, it's incomplete. <laughs> Right, mm -hmm. you're not omniscient, uh, right? And so the idea is that if you have some budget to go collect more data, how can you learn what kind of data should you collect, right? And where should you go and ask? And um, so the limitations of using machine learning in these cases is the processes that are generating your data. So if the process that's generating your data is completely random, then the only thing that you can really learn is that the process is random. And luckily for social networks, we know that there are two dominant processes um, that lead to the social networks that we're seeing. One is preferential attachment. Everybody wants to be friends with a star, like the Beyonce's, the De Niro's, et cetera, yeah. right? And then um, closing of triangles, friends of friends right. of friends. And so when you have this kind of rich network structure where um, you have what we call heterogeneous degree distribution, or you can think of it as like a heavy tail degree distribution in terms of like number of friends that you have. And triangles, that's where you can exploit that relational dependency to actually learn. But if your processes that you're getting are completely random, then you cannot learn, right? And so th that was part of the work uh, on that paper to show this difference and in particular, it was important because computer scientists, um, and it, both whether they're researchers or practitioners, they take data as gospel and they do not cross-examine it. Uh, and I know like nobody wants to cross-examine data. It's just like, oh, it's data. I'm gonna like, you know, curate it, make money off of it, build models of it. But um, really looking at the data and the processes that are generating it will uh, help a lot, both in terms of having better models and in terms of serving your customers better, having a better product, et cetera. No, and that's fascinating. And now you've mentioned um, social networks um, as part of your work um, a number of times. And uh, let me ask the, 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 the question that we're not, is asking here, how much, how much sleep should we be losing? Um, like how, so based on the research of yourself and your colleagues, um, how worried should we be about the um, negative impacts of social networks? Yeah, I, I worry. I, I worry about the negative impacts of, of social networks because one, um, there, in some cases there's anonymity and that we know that human beings don't do well when they're anonymous, right? There's been lots of studies done where people behave better, for example, when they're in small towns and big cities uh, where they're more anonymous. And then it doesn't give a faithful view of life 
uh, right, of what is going on. Uh, to be honest with you, I use something like Twitter in a way as an RSS feed, right, in terms of, oh, these are people that I like to hear what kind of work they're doing or to use it to, to advertise a work of my students. Um, but, yeah, I feel like, you know, a lot of the social networks, they're like, <laughs> so 2008 at this point, right? They're yeah, all exactly. Done. Yeah. And, that, and that leads to, um, you know, a, an exact question that because um, you mentioned earlier, like uh, people are just taking um, uh, data as, as gospel and um, that's one issue. And then the second is um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of industry is actually collecting um, training data from um, online uh, sources, social network sources, where, again, you know, you have a lot of bad actors. So... Um, you know, you think that's a big problem, like with the with the quality of um, this data people are collecting online, like collecting data in the wild? Yeah, there are issues in that that data is often misogynistic, uh, right? It's often homophobic. It's often uh, it has lots of societal bias problems in it. And so if you don't um, pay attention to them, then the model that you're learning will also have all of those, you know, traits of misogyny and homophobia and xenophobia. And is that what you want? That's the question, right? right. If that's what you want, then that's what you want. And um, there's recent work that's been done in terms of how, even if you curate this data, right? You're like, okay, I'm gonna go clean it. It still has uh, enough dependency in it where you would find um, this kinds of uh, social biases or the kind of, things that I feel like we don't want, right? We don't want sexism. We don't want racism. We don't, right? Ideally, we don't want these things, right? Even though they're in our society. Yeah, and then a follow-up question, which I was going to ask later, but I think it's now's the right time to ask it. But um, we've been focusing um, ODSC. We've lots of talks around uh, pre-trained models. There have been huge breakthroughs in that in the last two or three years. Um, it's big in NLP. So you have these... Um, massive pre-trained models um, a lot of times they're scraped from wikipedia and sources like that um so i think you mentioned the paper and um and some other concerns around these large pre-trained models if you can speak to what is very uh, a very um uh, popular topic in the ai data science community at the moment yeah so let me give you one example this is actually an example of uh, Meg Mitchell, who was the co-lead uh, for ethical AI at Google, uh, where if you look at Wikipedia, um, the majority of the contributions are by young, single Caucasian males who are, you know, in their like early 20s, uh, like mid to late 20s and, you know, early to mid 30s. And so that is the view you're getting. Is that the right view? <laughs> Is, is that the population that you want to look at? And I think for a while there, if you went and typed uh, in like um, black people, it would just go to African-Americans. Uh, and of course that's not all black people, right? And so, so there's this notion of how diverse is what you are feeding to your models, right? How much of the society is it capturing or is it just capturing a particular slice of it? And if it is, then that's fine. But at least you should be honest that, look, this is only for, right, uh, people who are like 25 to 34 and are Caucasian and are male and went to college, right? But great. Let's do that. Right. Uh, but at least be honest about it. Yeah, and it's funny. Like the, the joke used to be, um, uh, what's the definition of a data scientist? It's a 25-year-old male who lives in San Francisco. Um, yeah. <laughs> just gives you an idea of it. And um, yeah, and, 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 and as practitioners, what we have realized is um, that much, much of bias is unintentional. We hope, at least, much of bias is unintentional. And um, that's a great example you just gave, Tina. And there are other examples um, well known out there around the same um, you know, white occasion, um, like voice, voice assistants from Amazon, Alexa, or Siri, um, primarily being trained on white voices and having a much higher error rate on um, non white voices. So. You know, uh, in the software engineering discipline, which I happen to be in as well, um, we rely on QA and quality insurance, quality assurance, and things like methodology like that. But in machine learning, it's much, much harder to do QA and quality assurance. So as machine learning practitioners, 
it's kind of a simple question. Like, how do we build better, fairer algorithms? Yeah. Well, what we have to do is put those values up front, right? What has happened a lot is um, you build your product. And then at the very end, before it's about to leave the door, you're like, oh, is it fair? Is it robust? Right. And that's not the right way of going about it. Right. So Helen Nissenbaum, who is a well-known professor at Cornell Tech, she calls it value by design. So from the very beginning, this has to be a first class citizen. Right. And definitions right. of fairness have to be clear from the very beginning. And then, of course, there are folks, uh, for example, my colleague, Crystal Wilson at Northeastern, works on auditing of algorithms, right? And of course, um, uh, Kathy O'Neill, who's the author of the famous book, Weapons of Mass Destruction, has a company that audits algorithms. So I feel like it's a multi-pronged approach, right? Where when you start thinking about how would I design this product, thinking more holistically, more inclusive, and then also, for example, one can then audit one's algorithm the same way we audit it to see if it's correct, right? Um, when right, whether it's giving the right answer, um, yeah. for example, in radiology or, or other kinds of uh, more factual um, areas. Yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's such a fascinating and um, interesting topic because um, again, drawing similarities between you know um, computer science, software engineering, and machine learning. When we're working on uh, computer science projects you have um you know system design specification um features and whatnot and um you know there's there's been a big move towards um going away from that and doing test driven design and thinking about issues very early in the design process i think um within the machine learning community and stuff like that and um, we're still very much focused on feature engineering feature selection and um not looking at things such as um uh these as well as and this we're going to get into the whole area of machine learning safety, which is uh, closely related as well, and I and I do love the whole um, the whole notion of um, uh, auditing algorithms, because when we did that in finance, we used to audit algorithms like do blind um, auditing, and that's what the QA discipline is around as well. So, I think there's still um, a lot of um, work to be done there. Now, yeah, I completely uh, agree with you. I, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you, but I completely oh, yeah, no, agree no, with no, you. For example, Ayana Howard who is the dean at, uh, the, I believe, the Dean of College of Engineering at Ohio State University now, she, she says, we don't build a bridge just for Caucasian people, right? Uh, or, right. for example, when we yeah. design an airplane, it has specific, uh, as you were saying, it has specification, and it will not fly unless those are checked. And so that is one way that AI algorithms can go, right? Whereas, right. like, okay, it has to meet these specifications, and if it doesn't, then you could have disclaimers, but this notion of designing tools that only work for a subpopulation is fine, but at least be honest, that's only for that subpopulation. Exactly, exactly. I understand that. And um, yeah, so I guess that leads to the ultimate question. Of, like, is it even possible to build you know, a fair algorithm? What one could consider a fair algorithm? Yeah, I think that's a, a too broad of a question. So the answer would be no. I think like, in terms of whether one can have a fair algorithm, um, perhaps for certain very narrow areas. Uh, but in general, if you think about the entire machine learning pipeline from defining the task to getting the data to defining the model, the mathematical model, uh, to what is your loss function, to what is your optimization algorithm, to then how people use it, how it's deployed in every step something bad can happen, right? And so in some work that we did, um, we generated this thing called um, aspirational data. And uh, a lawyer colleague of mine, right. Debbie Ramirez, came up with the name aspirational data, where you're generating data that you know it's fair under some definition of fairness. And so we generated data that was fair equality of opportunity, a satisfied fair equality of opportunity, by John Rawls, this notion that in our society, we have these advantageous positions. And uh, when you get an advantageous position, like a high paying job, it should really just depend on your talent. It shouldn't depend on other things like social economic status, et cetera. And so you can represent this fair equality of opportunity as conditional independence. 
uh, in a Bayesian network and then generate data from it that you know for a fact satisfies that fairy tale of the opportunity. But then if you give that data to, let's say, another Bayesian network to train that other Bayesian network, it, you're not guaranteed that that other Bayesian network will be faithful or correct to um, the fairy quality of opportunity. And so at every step, one needs to be careful. And this is why in terms of the auditing of um, basically like, okay, this algorithm is fair, but under these circumstances, right? And right, it's usually right. a very small, narrow sense of fairness as opposed to this whole thing of like justice and so on and so forth. Um, exactly. Yeah. No, no. Excellent answer. And so at ODS East, um, in a couple of weeks, we've got uh, two related tracks. One is on responsible AI, as we mentioned, and the other one is on machine learning safety, um, or sometimes called AI safety. And safety is definitely um, a popular research topic in machine learning. I, I think I've been hearing AI safety uh, talks at um, ICML in Europe for the last couple of years. Um, but do you Think um, I think most of our audience is somewhat are fairly familiar with um, machine learning safety or AI safety. Um, and, but as practitioners, do you think industry is adapting machine learning safety quickly enough? I think it depends on the industry, right? I mm -hmm. think, for example, folks in cybersecurity have been <laughs> bitten True. one too many times. And so right. they're a lot more careful about yeah. people trying to evade their models or poison their models. So it depends on the particular um, particular industry, right? Or for example, if you have an autonomous vehicle and it's collecting data and we know that they are vulnerable um, to attacks, right? The famous one about like, I have a stop sign image and I blur um, some of the pixels and now it doesn't think it's a stop right. sign. And so um, I think it depends on the particular industry. I think people are aware that um, there are adversaries out there who want to um, make your machine learning model um, um, either perform poorly for a particular person or holistically perform poorly, right? right? Across everybody doing uh, per performing poorly. And so they are, they are very much looking at like, how, how can we fix this? Yeah, I think when we were discussing this earlier, you mentioned a couple of papers um, that Irene has shared. Uh, one is on... Um, um uh, pat attack i believe um you're saying yeah because uh cyber and ai and those two fields come together is, is uh pretty fascinating um and i guess that kind of leads to so you know especially when you get into the realm of um, machine learning safety and some examples you came up with um you know lives are lives are definitely riskier so at what point do you think um AI is going to adopt, um, you know, is going to either self-regulate um, or need independent oversight. Yeah, I think um, whether we like it or not, independent oversight is going to come our way. But I think the better way is for us to have professional norms. Um, yeah. For example, in medicine or in biology uh, or biomedicine, for example, there are professional norms. Uh, when the Chinese doctor used CRISPR um, to change the genome of a fetus, he was excommunicated from his professional community, and I believe he's in jail now. Um, we have nothing like that in AI machine learning. Like, you can do anything you want, and, right, um, and nothing happens to you. Um, there's no, in a way, accountability. And so I feel like we should have some professional norms um, there are certain things that perhaps we should not do, right? Like if uh, I'm running a social platform and I'm detecting that Bob uh, is bipolar and is about to go manic, I shouldn't be showing him ads that are risky. It will ruin his life and his family's life, even though I will make a lot of money off of it. And so there's certain, like, it seems to me, professional norms, like basic values um, that we should talk about as a as a profession. Yeah, and, and and just getting back to um Northeastern for a second, I know I, I believe you have a PhD program in um in in network science, is that correct? We do have a PhD program in network science. Yes. Anyone, anyone's interested in this, um they can apply for that. And um how much of this is covered in in third level institutions now? 
So there's a lot of effort in terms of embedding ethics in computer science uh, curriculum. So not just one class, uh, but across the board um, as for, for undergraduates, um, there's obviously a lot of uh, papers that are now being written in terms of like trustworthy AI, where like fair AI falls into it. Um, a definition of trustworthy AI is uh, human-centered AI, right? And so the explainability, privacy, fairness, accountability, all that um, comes into it. Um, and so uh, the problem that I see with the whole effort on trustworthy AI is that there's this huge gap between the privileged folks in our profession who are saying, oh, look, I'm generating products or, or look, oh, I'm advancing science. And then there are the marginalized people in our profession who are saying, look, these algorithms are causing harm to people right now. Like we should step back. We should think about what's happening. And I'm not sure if like that divide can be shrunk um, um, just by itself. I feel like that needs education from the undergraduates and from high school. So earlier this week, I was part of a panel at Museum of Science in Boston talking to high schoolers uh, about um, how do we navigate our AI world. Um, and I also had a perspective piece in Nature with some colleagues uh, in July about how our societies now are infused with algorithms. And so your algorithm or your product is not an island. It's part of this complex system. And so there's feedback, right? So when Amazon makes recommendations and based on those recommendations, you buy something, it affects the stock of that company, then that feeds back into the recommendation algorithm. And so round and round right. you go. And so it's not just like, oh, I'm just doing recommendation algorithm by itself over here. And this, and it's not just Amazon, right? It's online dating, which is very popular now. Yeah. Obviously the political process is another one. And so we live in these, um, in these societies that are infused with algorithms. And so we should watch out and we should think about it. What that means? No, no the um, yeah, and uh, thinking about network science, graph theory, um, um, these algorithms, especially these closed loop systems where they're self reinforcing, um, and, and and the harm they can cause is, is absolutely a, a topic we could spend a couple <laughs> of hours on. Um, but you are Tina, you are speaking at ODSC East um, in a couple of weeks, and your um, session is titled uh, uh, "Just Machine Learning." And by the way, anyone can um, come check that talk out. But um, I know we've covered quite a few, few, few of the uh, topics um, that may be in your talk already, but can you give us a few more highlights about your about the talk you'll be giving um, in a few short weeks? Yeah, so... Yet. <laughs> I'm not yes, sure. Yes, no, working. that's okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, the title, um, Just Machine Learning, um, is a part of a big project that I have, uh, which actually started... Uh, a few years ago, when my friend Danielle Allen, who at the time was the director of the Safra Center, asked me to come and give a public lecture about ethics and AI. Mm -hmm. And so I started with just figuring out, like, what are people doing? And so a lot of the work that people have done are, the, are on these, like, statistical notions of fairness. And there are impossibility results that, like, you cannot have um, a bunch of these fairness qualities that you want satisfied all at once. And so then if you can't have them all satisfied all, all at once, which one do you pick? Or how do you deal with this impossibility? Um, so that's part of it. Uh, I will also talk about the idea of how can you make aspirational data? Um, there are different ways that aspirational data is good because you can also help policymakers through the aspirational data. Um, and then I will also talk about where machine learning can be good for. For example, it can be good at showing when uh, policy is not uh, being executed properly or that policy should change. So if you look at stop and frisk in New York City, um, the intent of the policymakers wasn't to stop and harass um, young people of color. I don't think that, that was, at least that's not what they said in public forum. Uh, but if you look at how that policy was executed and reconstruct the intent of the policy, you get that, oh, wait, hmm, it looks yeah. like they just wanted to harass these young people. Like, why is that happening? Um, and then I will end with a study that we just recently did. This is a qualitative study about um, just uh, the pulse of our community in terms of how they view um, negative societal impact of their research, of the products that they're putting out. 
Um, and we have a long way to go on that side because there's a lot of this notion of, uh, well, I just generate the algorithm. Uh, I have no agency in what the, the downstream person uses it for. And there's a lot of this assigning the responsibility to the practitioner, right? Like I just design it, right? It's the practitioner who says fault if something bad happens. And I think that is not the right view. No, that's uh, that's great insight. And um, just to wrap up on our last uh, final few questions, Tina, um, you know, what areas of research in this field are, are you excited about? Um, perhaps um, maybe firstly, uh, you, you touched upon some of the research you're already doing, but what's kind of um, got you excited for the next couple of years? And then um, what about um, others people, other people's work that you're, you're looking at quite closely? Yeah, so one area that I'm super excited about is uh, this notion of information access equality on social networks. And I think that um, the, 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 the practitioners among us will also like it. This notion of recommendation, which is big, right, in our communities, uh, where uh, if you're running a platform, you can recommend uh, for Tina to connect to accounts that will push your uh, social network or whatever network, economic network, if you're LinkedIn, toward a place where there's more information access equality, um, where people, regardless of their background, will get the information at the same rate. In terms of what I'm interested in, in terms of like just research and, and um, the challenges, is that there's usually this trade-off between efficiency and equality, right? And so, and we have also seen this in terms of like robustness and accuracy. And so looking at these trade-offs and seeing how can we have the best of both worlds um, is something that's very interesting. Fascinating. And um, people want to follow your work, what you're working on, of course, they can just um, Google you, go to your Northeastern um, uh, page. They'll find yeah. a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of your links to your uh, papers and um, other research you're looking at, and any other good source of information for, um, you know, network science, um, fair AI, um, responsible AI, machine learning safety. You can you can recommend. Yeah, so there's the Network Science Society. So if they just go to any search engine and type Network Science Society, they'll see it. And then in terms of um, uh, fairness, accountability, etc., there is a um, effort that's run out of uh, Harvard, um, uh, Professor Hema runs it, um, it's called trustworthyml.org. So if you go to, to, to trustworthyml.org, there's lots of really good resources there um, that people can look at. I'm going to go look at it now. Actually, I haven't heard of that one myself. Well, Tina, thank you so much for um, coming on the show. Really, really looking forward to your talk in uh, two short weeks. And um, Thank you once again. It was an excellent uh, conversation, some awesome insights, and can't thank you enough. Thank you, Seamus. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.